This video is brought to you by Campfire. Good morning interweb, let's world build. In the last video we looked at the various land systems and landforms that occur in glaciated environments. In this video let's look at the landscapes that are left behind when glaciers retreat. Any of the landforms mentioned in the previous video, arets, horns, calls, etc, will become more exposed and so more dramatic once the mountain glaciers have fully receded. Mountain ice caps will smooth and round any peaks that were submerged in the ice. Any unsubmerged peaks, none attacks, will, due to frost shattering, be made more jagged and rugged. Cirque glaciers will leave behind cirques or corries, which will oftentimes be filled with a small, moraine dammed lake known as a tarn. Tarns may be seasonal or persistent. The various types of valley glacier, regular, hanging, piedmont, etc., will leave behind deep glacial troughs known as U shaped valleys. U-shaped valleys may be several hundreds of meters deep and tens of kilometers long, and may be host to a wide variety of landforms. The head or uppermost part of the U-shaped valley will often be a steep, almost sheer, rugged rocky face known as a trough end. Expect waterfalls here. The floor of a U-shaped valley will, for the most part, be wide and flat. Where bands of soft rock are present, the valley glacier will have carved depressions into the rock, tens to hundreds of meters deep, forming fjord lakes, large lakes spanning most if not all of the valley floor, or paternoster lakes, smaller lakes that chain together like beads on a string, hence the name. Where bands of hard rock are present, valley steps will form on the valley floor. The up ice or stoss side of the step will be smoother and gently sloping, whereas the down ice or lee side of the step will be steep and rugged. If a step spans the entire valley floor, it's called a regal, Regals may impound lakes and, depending on their height, may have rapids or waterfalls cascading over them. Medial moraines, erratics, canes and eskers may also be present on the valley floor. The remnants of the glacier's medial moraine may run as a ridge or mound of glacial debris, aka till, down the centre of the valley floor, though most rarely survive glacial retreat. Erratics, large far-travelled boulders, may be randomly strewn across the valley floor. These can be anything from little pebbles up to massive boulders weighing several thousands of tons. Cames are flat topped little hillocks of till, about 100 meters long and 10-ish meters wide. Eskers are long, winding ridges of till. In alpine regions, these may be tens of kilometers long, tens of meters wide and a few meters high. Cames and eskers typically occur together and are a product of glacial meltwater. And finally, a ground moraine or till sheet is a blanket of mixed till covering the valley floor. Basically, any and all of the material that didn't go into forming the above features gets dumped randomly across the valley, forming a gently undulating landscape with low rises and ridges alternating with small depressions, kettles and kettle ponds. Kettles are small bowl-shaped depressions that form when a detached or buried block of ice melts. At the sides of the U-shaped valley, we can expect to find the remnants of the glacier's lateral moraines. These ridges or mounds of till may be hundreds of meters high and wide, though most are way smaller and are prone to being eroded away over time. Alternatively, came terraces may be present. These are long, flat, bench-like, kettle-pitted deposits of sediment that line the valley sides. They are also a product of glacial meltwater. The walls of the valley will feature alternating hanging valleys and truncated spurs. Truncated spurs are steep inverted V-shaped cliffs that form when the interlocking spurs of a pre-glaciated river valley get bulldozed by the valley glacier. Hanging valleys will enter the main trunk U-shaped valley at elevation. If the hanging valley was glaciated, it'll be a U-shaped valley and so will feature any and all of the landforms we've discussed so far. Spectacular waterfalls often drain the hanging valley into the main trunk U-shaped valley. And finally, near what was once the snout or end of the valley glacier, end moraine complexes may form. The retreating glacier will leave behind its end moraine as an arc-shaped deposit of glacial till about 60-ish meters in height. This end moraine marks the furthest extent of the glacier, so we call it a terminal moraine. Oftentimes, glacial retreat is not linear. A retreating glacier may speed up, slow down, stop or even advance depending on how hot or cold the climate at any given time was. If the glacier repeatedly halted during its retreat, a series of end moraines called recessional moraines will form behind the terminal moraine. 
The longer the halt, the more material builds up, the higher and larger the newer end moraine will be. Expect lakes to get impounded here. Anytime the glacier briefly advanced, it would have bulldozed a bunch of material at its snout, forming push moraines, which could make the landscape look like a rough ploughed field, or just increase the size of a recessional moraine. Overall, expect the landscape here to be generally quite chaotic looking. And that is what deglaciated mountain landscapes can look like. One final note though before we move on to continental glaciers. If a U-shaped valley gets partially flooded by seawater, it's called fjord. So expect fjords to be present any time you have a coastal mountain range that would once have been glaciated, but currently is not. Most fjords are deeper than the adjoining sea, with their terminal moraines forming a sill or shoal at their mouths. Oftentimes, these ridges cause extreme currents, saltwater rapids, whirlpools, and maelstroms. And just for the sake of completion, a fully submerged U-shaped valley is called a marine trough. Continental glaciers blanket all topography, highlands and lowlands. The landforms left behind in the highland regions of a continental glacier will be identical to those we just talked about. The post-continental glacier lowland regions will differ a bit. A good chunk of these regions will be dominated by Knock and Lochen topography. These are vast, low-lying regions spanning several hundreds of kilometres in area. The landscape is gently undulating, with innumerable depressions and lakes alternating with small rocky hills and outcroppings. Think the northwest of Scotland. Those rocky hills may come in a variety of forms. Domes are, well, small dome-shaped rocky hills, less than about 100 metres in size. Their surface is smooth and exfoliated. Roche Moutonnais are, again, small hills of solid rock, less than 100 metres in size. Unlike domes, they are streamlined or elongated in the direction of the ice flow. Their stoss sides are gently sloping, and their lee sides are steep, rugged, and cliff-like. A medium-sized Roche Moutonnais between 100 and 1,000 metres long is called a whaleback or rock drumlin, and the largest Roche Moutonnais over 1,000 metres long are called flugbergs. Crag and tails are large rugged outcroppings of resistant rock, often volcanic in origin, with a smooth sloping tail of till in their lees. Expect important settlements to spring up on and around crag and tails. The crag is easily defensible, prime castle real estate, and the tail is a great location for a settlement. Edinburgh Castle in Edinburgh, Scotland is built on a crag, and the city's old town is located on the tail. Various different types of ground moraine may occur in post-continental glacier lowlands. De Geer or washboard moraines form wherever the continental glacier met a sea or lake. They are basically the same as recessional moraines, only they form underwater. They form as a series of parallel ridges perpendicular to the direction of the ice flow. They tend to be about 5 meters high, 10 to 50 meters wide, and spaced up to 300 meters apart. If, after the glacier has disappeared, the land rises or the water level drops, the De Geer moraines may become exposed, forming a stunning landscape similar to that of the Kvarken Archipelago in Finland. Rogan moraines may dominate the interior of what was the continental ice sheet. They are wavy, arc-shaped deposits of till lying perpendicular to the direction of the ice flow, with their horns pointing in the down ice direction. They often occur in close, regularly spaced groups, with each individual moraine tending to be about 10 to 30 meters high, 150 to 300 meters wide, and anywhere between 300 and 1,200 meters long. Lakes tend to fill the depressions between them, giving the landscape a mad tiger stripe vibe when viewed from above. In close proximity to Rogan moraines, and or close to the edge of the former continental glacier, drumlin fields are often found. Drumlins are smooth hills of glacial till elongated in the direction of the ice flow. Their stoss sides are steep, and their lee sides are gently sloping. Typically, drumlins are about 250 to 1,000 meters long, and between 120 and 300 meters wide. They tend to occur together in their hundreds or even thousands, forming a drumlin field or drumlin swarm, which gives the landscape a basket of eggs type topography. Think rolling hills or the Shire. Also near the margins of the continental glacier, we may find tunnel valleys. These are gorges two to four kilometers wide, 100 plus meters deep, and 30 to 100 kilometers long. They form when subglacial meltwater cuts into the underlying bedrock. Tunnel valleys may become filled with sediment, forming dry valleys, or water, forming lakes, 
like the Finger Lakes in New York State. Till plains are low-lying regions blanketed in a thick ground moraine. These regions are almost flat, slightly rolling, and gently sloping. Till plains can be extremely fertile, so they'd be great locations for farming operations. And just like with mountain glaciers, we can also expect to find eskers, kames, and erratics. Same as their alpine counterparts, just bigger. Continental glacier eskers may be hundreds of kilometers long, a few hundred meters wide, and several tens of meters high. In Ireland, an esker, the Esker Rieda, runs across the entire width of the country, which, because it was elevated from the surrounding boglands, functioned as a highway for the ancient people of the island. Cames may occur in came fields, giving rise to came and kettle topography. And erratics will be thick boys. Big Rock in Alberta, Canada weighs in at about 16,000 tonnes. And finally, near the snout of the Continental Glacier, we'd expect to find end moraine complexes. Again, like before, but bigger. For example, a terminal moraine of a Continental Glacier may be hundreds of kilometres long, hundreds of metres high, and several kilometres wide. So far, we've looked at post-glacial landscapes, landscapes where the ice has totally disappeared. But if your planet is anything like modern-day Earth, you'll likely have many regions that are still partially glaciated with retreating glaciers. Retreating glaciers are melting glaciers, so expect glacial fluvial landforms, landforms created by glacial meltwater, to dominate in these regions. Meltwater flowing on the surface of a mountain glacier will form superglacial ponds and meltwater channels. These bodies of meltwater may drain through crevasses and moulins. Round, near-vertical potholes in the glacier, about 10-ish metres in diameter, extending down to bedrock. The sediment carried by the meltwater will be deposited in these locations, and will eventually give rise to the cames we talked about earlier, once the glacier fully retreats. Meltwater can also flow at the sides of a mountain glacier. Expect to find ice marginal ponds and channels. Again, sediment will be deposited here, giving rise to the came terraces from earlier. Meltwater flowing at the base of a mountain glacier may carve channels into the bedrock or into the ice itself. The former would produce small tunnel valleys, and the latter produces a system of glacial caves within the glacier, which will eventually get choked with sediment and form eskers. Most of the meltwater dough will eventually make its way to the front of the glacier. If the mountain glacier terminates on a plain, a system of braided rivers of meltwater called an outwash plain or sandor will form. This chap in Iceland is the prototypical example here. Sediment will get sorted by the meltwater, so expect large debris near the snout of the glacier slash terminal moraine, and finer debris further down the outwash plain. The outwash plain will also tend to be pitted with kettle holes and kettle lakes. Now, if the glacier terminates in a valley, the entire width of the valley will become an outwash plain, creating what's known as a valley train. Lakes are common in front of glaciers. These may be dammed by a moraine or by the ice itself. If the dam breaks or a lake overtops its barrier, a glacial outburst flood may occur. These floods may be sporadic or seasonal, and they are no joke. The 1918 Katla Jökulhlup, a type of glacial outburst flood in Iceland, moved about 300,000 cubic meters of water, 25,000 tons of ice, and another 25,000 tons of debris every hour? Nope. Every minute? Nope. Every second. And that's just a mountain glacier induced flood. It gets worse with continental glaciers. So the glacial fluvial landforms of retreating continental glaciers are largely similar to those of mountain glaciers, except bigger and badder. Instead of superglacial meltwater ponds and channels, expect massive superglacial lakes and rivers of meltwater, with immense meltwater waterfalls cascading into giant moulins or over the edge of the ice margin into mega proglacial lakes. Such mega lakes were common during the last ice age, and when they outburst, they unleashed enough force to rework the proglacial environment into channeled scablands, vast, flat expanses deeply scarred by meltwater channels, canyons, and gorges, with poor soil and little to no vegetation. Or the glacial outburst floods were so cataclysmic that they reworked the shape of the land masses themselves like the Straits of Dover, are thought to have been carved out by a massive 
mega glacial outburst flood some 350 to 450,000 years ago. So in summary, both glacial types, mountain and continental, for the most part leave behind similar landforms, with scale, most of the time, being the major differentiating factor. Use this video to figure out where your glaciers were during your world's last ice age, and use this video to figure out where they currently are. Links in the usual places to these. Post-glacial landscapes will go here, glacio-fluvial landscapes will go here, and fully glaciated landscapes will go here. Done and done. Laters! Good morning and a massive thanks to Campfire for sponsoring the show. More than 100,000 writers use Campfire to organise, improve and showcase their writing. Organise your stories in Campfire Write with over a dozen modules like character sheets, timelines, relationship webs and a manuscript editor that lets you reference your notes while you write. Everything you create is private safely stored in the cloud and shareable to collaborate with friends. Improve your craft with Campfire Learn, their hub of educational resources. Showcase your projects in Campfire Explore to share your work with the community and build a following. Choose what parts of your project to share and craft a homepage to present your story. Create an account for free and enjoy access to everything from the start. If you're working on bigger projects in Campfire Write, you only have to pay for the features you need. Subscriptions start from as low as 50 cents per month or pay a one-time price with Campfire's a la carte options. Plus Campfire has massive updates on the way like more modules, an offline desktop app, a mobile app, and this is cool, the ability to monetize your writing in Campfire Explorer. So write better stories faster with Campfire. Click the link in the description to learn more. Again, thank you Campfire, for sponsoring the show. Also, a massive thanks goes out to you for watching the show and a massive thanks goes out to all of my wonderful, wonderful patrons. In particular, Lycan, Johan Spadka, Oliver Reed, Spencer Brownlee, Alexander Roper, Andrew Pisha Hale, John Huyer, Ripta Passe, and World Anvil. Until next time, Edgar Rouse.